Welcome PCS members and uh, friends to our today's uh, Tuesday PCS IBS seminar. It is a great pleasure to have with us Dr. Philip Strasberg uh, from University of Barcelona. And I would like to invite our scientific host, uh, Dominic, to introduce our speaker. Please, Dominic. Hi, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Philip Strasberg. Um, a little bit about his uh, past. He did his PhD in Berlin under the supervision of Tobias Brandes. Uh, his uh, PhD thesis was called Thermodynamics and Information Processing at the Nanoscale. And then he did a short postdoc there afterwards. He, his first longer postdoc was with Massimiliano Esposito Luxembourg. Uh, he published heavily in topics such as Maxwell's Demons, non equilibrium thermodynamics quantum stochastic thermodynamics, non-Markovianity, and entropy production. And then he switched to uh, Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, uh, to the quantum information group there, which uh, includes Andras Winter and Anna Sampera, with uh, whom he published. And uh, he continued on topics such as non-equilibrium uh, and especially quantum thermodynamics. He also thought a lot, a lot about the second uh, thermodynamic law there um, and developed a new way of defining entropy production, which is uh, superseding some drawbacks of the standard way of defining it and define a new heat, uh, a new definition of heat temperature. And I, I think that's what we will talk about today. Recently, he also became a junior leader fellow. Um, on the quest to boost quantum nanotechnologies with non equilibrium resources, so very cool stuff. And uh, he wrote a book, Quantum Stochastic Thermodynamics, Foundations and Selective Applications. And uh, very excited to see that it's going to come out this fall. In my own personal experience, I can describe him as a very deep and careful thinker. So you can be sure when he says something, he thought about it a lot. So that's about it. And Philip, uh, it's yours now. Yes. Uh, thanks, Dominic. Uh, thanks for the very nice introduction. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for coming uh, to everyone. I, I thought I'd start without sharing my slides to wave into the screen and say hello to make things a bit more personal in this online uh, format. So today I will talk about entropy and the second law. Um, and this will more or less summarize my, my research about the last uh, two or three years. Um, and I will try to give a really introductory and pedagogical talk uh, starting really far back in time. Um, and I will also introduce some kind of old concepts but which are forgotten and where I think they really deserve more attention and nowadays. And I will finally also talk about uh, very recent results, which I think are, are very promising. So um, let me now share my screen. Here you go. You should see it on full screen. Um, and you should see my mouse. So before I start with the physics, let me acknowledge uh, uh, the people who worked uh, with me on that. This is Maria Garcia Diaz, Andrea Vera Company, Anna Sanferra, and Andreas Winter, who are all at the Universidad Autonoma de Barcelona. Um, and before I show you any outline, I want to throw you into the cold water, basically, and present to you um, an experimental setup, uh, which is almost 10 years ago, and which was done in the group of uh, Tillman Esslinger in Zürich. And what you can see here is two clouds of ultra cold atoms. Um, and they can be prepared with different energies and particle numbers or, or temperatures and chemical potentials, if you like. And this together is a completely isolated system. And then by using laser beams, they can basically create a transport channel such that these clouds can exchange uh, energy and matter. Um, and then they initialize the clouds at different temperatures and, and basically see, see what happens in time. And I admit that 
I'm not at all an expert on these uh, physical setups. I, I wish I were, but I think the beauty of this experiment is really that every physicist has immediately an intuition of what is going to happen. And this you can see here on the right. So as I said, they start with a temperature imbalance and then particles start to flow such that the temperature difference becomes smaller in time. But of course, when particles are flowing and you have initially the same number of particles and there's a particle imbalance uh, created, and at some point this takes over and particles flow again back in the other direction. And I think you can see here also a slight increase in temperature again. And in the long run, everything should uh, equilibrate to the same temperature and, and chemical potential. And now if you take out um, the textbook on thermodynamics, you could analyze the situation as follows. So you would say, okay, you have two, two heat bars. I label them with nu, uh, which stands for hot and cold. And overall, that's an equilibrium setup, but let's assume each heat bar is well described by equilibrium properties. And then you would say, the change in entropy of bars nu is minus dq over t, where the minus is just a convenient sign convention uh, for later on. So it's not important here. And dq is the heat flux. And since you have energy and particle ex exchanges, it looks like that when mu is the chemical potential. And then if you add up the entropy of both parts and you integrate over it in time, so from here to here, uh, then this basically gives you total entropy production or change in entropy, and that's hopefully positive. And the goal of this talk will be really to reach a complete microscopic understanding of, of these laws of thermodynamics, how they emerge, um, how you can quantify them microscopically, how you have to define these basic quantities um, such that you get uh, the right framework out. Okay, so this should serve as an overall motivation. My talk is split into three parts. First, I will give a brief and broad historical overview about entropy in the second law. And then I think the second part is the most crucial part because I will talk about how to define heat, entropy, and temperature microscopically, uh, even for systems which are out of equilibrium, all right? And then the last part, will be relatively quick, quick and based on, on part two, where I just show you a couple of results and applications, so things you can do by using these kind of uh, definitions. All right. So let me start to talk about entropy uh, by going back to the birthday of entropy, which was in 1865, in a very famous paper by, by Clausius, where he first introduced the name entropy. And actually his paper ended with two sentences saying uh, the energy of the world is constant and the entropy of the world tends to a maximum. And this is basically the standard formulation of the first and second law. So in equations, you would say the energy, I mean, I write universe instead of world is constant and the entropy of the universe is, is non-decreasing. And let me emphasize universe does not necessarily refer to the universe uh, in the cosmological sense, but it could be really any kind of setup which you could, uh, which you can view as sufficiently isolated from the rest of the world. For instance, this kind of ultra cold atoms experiment would be for the time space of the experiment also uh, a universe. All right, so this is pure phenological uh, thermodynamics. And now, of course, the question arose, how do you derive these kind of laws from an underlying mechanical and microscopic picture? And this was really the lifelong problem of Boltzmann. So, um, so these dates are actually the time, you know, indicates the time he worked on it. So I think he was born 20 years before that. And he worked roughly 40 years on, on this problem uh, until his death. And and what was the problem? Well, the question is, in general, if you have something symmetric, how can you get something asymmetric out? And what I mean by that is that if you look at the uh, Newton's equation, or today we will be interested in Schrodinger's equation mostly, but Boltzmann, of course, didn't know about that. Um, 
then these equations have a property which is often called time reversal symmetry. So, so in principle, I mean, the important point is that these equations, they are basically reversible and deterministic and really provide a one-to-one -one map uh, of your dynamics. And out of these equations, we want to have an expression, a law, which is time asymmetric, clearly, all right? And the question is, how do you get this out? And there are actually various ways to do that. And Boltzmann's favorite explanation was the following. So he imagined that the entire universe is a very big place and is in thermal equilibrium. So it has maximum entropy, all right? This is sketched here. But Boltzmann said, okay, but the, the universe is basically infinitely large. And since he was doing statistical mechanics, he knew about fluctuations. And then he concluded, well, the probability that at some region in, in the universe, there's a very large downward fluctuation in entropy, which I tried to sketch here, becomes sufficiently large. And our existence now is due to the fact that we are now on our way back from this large entropy fluctuation to the maximum entropy value, all right? And you might imagine this explanation is no longer the, the most uh, the, the, the accepted uh, explanation. Um, in particular, Boltzmann didn't know about actually something like a Big Bang or the expansion of the universe and all that. And also this explanation creates these famous Boltzmann brain paradoxes. So what is nowadays the typical explanation of, of, of the microscopic origin of the second law is the following. And known, uh, it became known as a past hypothesis. And in a nutshell, it's given by this simple well-known fact. So if you want to solve a differential equation, like a Schrodinger equation, uh, so if you really want to compute anything, we know that you always have to specify an initial condition or some other boundary condition. And then the second law really is regarded as a, as a consequence of the fact that the universe started in a low entropy state. And I think if that's true, I think it's really mind blowing because it really tells you the second law is not a consequence of, of the dynamics itself, but really about the initial condition. And here I've again provided a sketch and took some numbers which were computed by, by Roger Penrose some time ago. And he computed, okay, our, our uh, the entropy of the initial universe at the Big Bang was roughly that large in units of KB. Um, and the maximum entropy could be this number. I think he computed it by simply collapsing all the matter and energy into a black hole. And again, our world is somewhere in between, and we exist basically because we are in this upward trend of increasing entropy. And if you look here, this is a cosmic microwave background. I think you have recognized that, which was shortly after, um, after the Big Bang when the universe became transparent. And actually, this describes perfect thermal equilibrium of, of the radiation and matter. And um, you might wonder, oh, isn't thermal equilibrium a maximum entropy state? Well, it is, but actually this picture still does not take into account that there's also gravity, right? And actually most of this entropy increase comes due to the uh, gravitational entropy of, of black holes. And- Philip. Yes. Sorry, uh, we have a question from Dominic. Sure. Yeah, this is really funny. I wonder if somebody have computed uh, entropy of the current world. You put it somewhere like 10 to the 88, but is there some middle number? Ah, I mean, this should be the entropy of the current world here. Yeah. Oh, this one, okay. Yeah, I tried oh, yeah, to. We are fairly close to the end. Mm. Well, I mean, still some orders of magnitude away. <laughs> no? All right. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're still... I mean, we're still some orders of magnitude away, I would say. Mm. And I mean, these time scales here, I mean, they can be enormous, no? So if we should be safe for the next years. In, All right. In, in terms of entropy. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, but 
I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting uh, picture to think about it. The thing I want to emphasize is that this is really now the common explanation. I think most people accept it. But I want to emphasize that there's also some criticism. I mean, in particular, the question, okay, does it make sense to compute the entropy of the universe? Also, with gravitational entropy, there are many open questions. Um, and there are alternative pictures to explain an error of time on, on a cosmological scale. But today, I will not talk about uh, cosmology, but I really want to focus on either isolated many body systems or open quantum systems where it's, I think, safe to, to apply thermodynamic principles and, and to use the concept of entropy. So let me go back to Clausius uh, once more, because I think he was really concerned with these kind of systems because he looked at some heat bars, which is described by some time dependent temperature, and there's a system coupled to it. And this system can be controlled through various parameters, like some external fields or some volume. I, I call these parameters lambda subscript t. And then Clausius knew already the following, and that's summarized here, and I call it a hierarchy of second laws um, for the following reasons. So you start with the total change in entropy of the bars and the system, so that's the universe, that should be positive. And for macroscopic systems, it's often justified that the effect of the surface can be neglected. So entropy becomes additive, and this term splits up into a system entropy change and a bars entropy change. And moreover, if the heat bus is ideal, so it's basically always well described by its temperature, then dS is equal to dQ over T, and then you have to integrate it. So you get this term. Um, where T of S is really the time dependent temperature of the bath. And this was really the, the expression Clausius wrote down. So I would call this the Clausius inequality. And what you see nowadays very often in the literature um, is the lower one here, which follows from the upper one in the case of a weakly perturbed bath. So what do I mean by that? I basically mean that the change in temperature of the bath is really small. So basically, the temperature is almost constant. You can pull it out of the integral. And then you just have an integral over dq. And this gives you the total heat flux q of t. All right. And, and this kind of hierarchy will play a central role later on because we want to derive this uh, microscopically. Before I turn to that, um, the last slide on, my, uh, on, on part one is devoted to the problem actually of how you could define entropy in thermodynamics. So really, um, I want to be clear that thermodynamics is an independent phenological theory not related to statistical mechanics, right? So it's really based on its own premises and axioms and its own laws and all that. And then the question arises, OK, how can you define entropy in, in general? And Clausius put forward the following idea. So again, we are considering this kind of system. Here's Clausius inequality. But of course, it's an inequality. So in general, this just provides a bound on this quantity. But then Clausius said the following. Um, suppose that you have an irreversible transformation from A to B. I've tried to sketch this here in the thermodynamic uh, phase space. So you go from A to B along this irreversible path by changing some parameters of the temperature. And then he just postulated, well, for all those transformations, there's also always a, con a corresponding reversible path, which brings you back from B to A. And if this is reversible, we know that this inequality becomes an equality. So you can use this to really define the change in entropy of the system. Um, and once you have this for, for all kinds of points A and B, you can apply this uh, uh, inequality always, all right? And here's really the point where one has to stop and think about it. Well, this is really meaningful. Um, and I think so far there's no universal agreement that this actually exists always, so that you can always associate a reversal path to an irreversible one. Um, and that's a big problem of thermodynamics. I think it's still an open problem. Um, 
how to define entropy for non-equilibrium states. And people like Jaynes, for instance, they, they even had the opinion that thermodynamics is fundamentally incomplete and you need statistical considerations to provide the correct definition of entropy uh, out of equilibrium. All right. And that was the end of part one. If there's any question, you can, of course, also interrupt me and ask. Otherwise, I just continue with part uh, two. Okay. So part two is about microscopic definitions for these central seminal concepts, uh, which are supposed to be valid also out of equilibrium. And to be crystal clear, let me um, review once more, write down once more the goal I have for this talk. So I want to have a microscopic derivation of, of this kind of hierarchy of second laws, where really each line follows from the previous line in a, in a certain limit. And I want to derive this solely based on unitary system bath dynamics. So there's this von Neumann equation, it's an isolated system. And if you talk about, say, a system in the bath, and then Miltonian has a standard form, splits into a system in the bath part and its action part. And in fact, there can be also some time dependence in the Hamiltonian, which I denote with this lambda subscript T um, uh, symbol. And as you can see, if you look at this, what are the three quantities we have to define? Well, this is entropy we have to define, heat and temperature, right? So I think these are really the three non-trivial thermodynamic concepts, uh, which I will define in the following. Let's start with heat. Uh, that might look, uh, I think the, the, that might be the simplest uh, definition. So as heat, I will just identify minus, and minus is just a convention, the change of bath energy. So microscopically, we'll just say, okay, it's, it takes a bath Hamiltonian, and you look at how the change uh, bath state changes, and it takes a trace, all right? Let me just, at this point, just mention that nowadays, there's also a lot of debate um, about the question whether this is the right definition at strong coupling. So if you have a strong system bath coupling, um, people are actively debating uh, uh, changes to, to this definition. And I think it's very interesting, but I would also claim it's quite a technical um, uh, discussion. And I want to rather focus on a, on a bigger picture today. And I will use this uh, definition, which will work for us. But I just wanted to mention that one has to be a bit careful, in particular at strong system bars coupling. Okay, that's our heat definition. Let's talk about entropy and let me start by reviewing, reviewing two um, popular candidates of entropy. Proposal number one, I think you all know this, it's for normal entropy, uh, probably the most common candidate for entropy defined like that. In particular, if you look at the eigenbasis of your density operator, um, this becomes basically the Shen entropy of the eigenvalues that really quantifies the total classical uncertainty in the state row. And that definition is certainly very useful for information theory, but it has a big problem uh, in our context where you want to derive microscopically the second law. Namely, it's well known that if you have an isolated system, which evolves unitarily, then the change in phenomenal entropy is zero. That would predict no entropy production, every process is reversible, um, and the second law would be always an equality. And that this rules out the phenomenal entropy as a good candidate for thermodynamic entropy was actually very clearly communicated by von Neumann himself uh, in a paper which was forgotten for quite some time and which just regains a lot of popularity now. So he writes, von Neumann entropy is not applicable to problems in statistical mechanics as it is computed from the perspective of an observer who can carry out all measurements that are possible in principle. And if there are experimentalists in the audience, I think you will immediately uh, believe me because if you really want to uh, 
compute this experimentally and rho is really a many body state say with 10 to the 23 spins or particles uh, it's impossible to do tomography on rho to be able to compute this phenomenon entropy and this is what he means that you know if you want to use that you implicitly assume that you have the experimental ability to really make all possible measurements uh, extremely fine measurements that are um, allowed in principle um, if you're a theoretician, well, maybe this comes a bit as a surprise for you because you might have often seen that phenomenon to be is the right uh, candidate for thermodynamic entropy. So let me stress that in fact, we know that it works really well as a candidate for thermodynamic entropy in two situations. So one is for equilibrium systems, if you make uh, also a proper choice of ensemble like a canonical ensemble or, or something like that then we know from textbooks that it's a, a good definition of entropy although this also hinges crucially on on the uh, equivalence of ensembles and all that but let's put this aside so for equilibrium systems it typically works well and then recent decades i think also have clearly proven that even for small systems which are far from equilibrium but weakly coupled to a bath for Neumann entropy is a good candidate for some entropy, but only of the system, not of the system plus bars. All right. So it works well sometimes, but definitely not always. And a second known entropy concept is known as Boltzmann entropy. Um, let me briefly review its definition. I, I'm sure you, you know it very well. So by the letter X, I just denote some macroscopic constraints. So, you know, you know, the energy up to some uncertainty or the particle number or some polarization, or I don't know what. And then VX is a number of microstates which are compatible with these constraints, okay? And I call it V for, for volume because it's basically some volume term in, in phase space. Then it takes a logarithm and this gives you Boltzmann's entropy. And this is a couple of nice properties that it, I think it quite intuitively explains the second law as a tendency of a system to, to spend most time in, in, in regions with a large phase space volume. And in particular, it's not conserved uh, along unitary dynamics. But I think it also faces problems. And this, this problem I want to um, briefly explain here. If you want to have a you know, detailed discussion with really calculations, you can actually look at a quite recent paper by, by Dominic. But the general problem is the following. Imagine you have a, a, a box divided into two halves. And initially, all the gas particles are on the left and here's a partition. And then you open a hole and the gas starts to diffuse uh, through the entire space. Then, what happens in terms of the entropy definitions is the following. If you look at von Neumann entropy, that's a blue line down here, that would stay simply constant, assuming that the box is perfectly isolated and, and reflecting, um, but then would stay constant. If you look at a naive guess of Boltzmann entropy, for instance, in terms of the energy of that state, then you would see immediately a discontinuous jump once you open a hole here into the, um, into the partition because suddenly you have more microstates available. So if you count them, you suddenly have a jump here. And this jump even happens if this hole is really epsilon tiny, all right? And that's a bit unrealistic. I think for a good candidate of some like entropy, you would expect something which interpolates smoothly from the initial value to, to that final value where everything is equilibrated and you have roughly as many particles on the left and on the right side. And I tried to summarize this problem of Boltzmann entropy by saying that it has little dynamical information. Um, so for, I guess, for our experimental abilities nowadays, it's a bit too, too coarse grain, one could say. Um, so it's better to have a concept which is, you know, able to really uh, interpolate between these extremes. Also, if you go to small systems, I mean, nowadays we can also measure small systems 
uh, so good that you really know the microstate of it, say spin up or spin down. And then of course, the number of states compatible with a single microstate is just one. So the log of one is zero. So Boltzmann would predict that for all small systems, the entropy is zero, which I think is also uh, clearly not true. So what's the situation? On the one end of the spectrum, there's phenomenal entropy, which is too fine-grained in general. On the other hand, there's Boltzmann entropy, which appears too coarse-grained, uh, in particular nowadays. So maybe it's a good idea to just combine both definitions into one definition. And this brings me to proposal number three. Uh, sorry, Philip, uh, we have a question uh, yes. from Dario. Yeah, uh, can you go uh, one slide before? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, here. When you say that for equilibrium systems, uh, let's say von Neumann works uh, with the proper choice of the ensemble is, let's say, is it related to the fact that, for example, in ETH, people don't care too much. I mean, they put, let's say, they say in the micro canal, you go to the micro canonical ensemble and you compute the, the von Neumann entropy of the associated ensemble. And that is what they use for the thermodynamical entropy, right? Um, yes, at equilibrium at least, yes. Okay, so essentially, okay. So that is the main reason, right? Because essentially von Neumann at equilibrium works, so can be used uh, safely in ETH or something like that. Right, I mean, von Neumann at equilibrium okay. for microcanonical ensemble is of course the same as Boltzmann, right? So then... Exactly, okay. And, and as I said, at equilibrium, things typically work out nicely. Although, yeah, because you, I mean, yeah, it's related to the next slide, right? I mean, that in equilibrium, you don't have this problem that Boltzmann make a, a sudden jump. I mean, yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, got it. I mean, thanks. To, to be fair, I mean, let me add that, you know, there, there are systems which are known to violate, for instance, the, the equivalence of ensembles. And then it's, I think, even an open question how to define or what, what is the right ensemble to start with how to define temperatures and all that. So there are even, I think, big conceptual open problems in equilibrium statistical mechanics. But mm -hmm. for most um, systems, it's equivalent holds, and then things are all fine, right? OK. OK, thanks. Right. Yeah. OK, yeah, thanks for the question. So let me go on. Yeah, so what was uh, the point? I said it's a good idea to, to combine these two uh, different approaches and to define a quantity called observational entropy. And that's defined with respect to some coarse graining X. So what do I mean by that? Well, I just mean a complete set of projectors. So they are all orthogonal and add up to the identity in the Hilbert space. And then you define the probability to find the system uh, in some state X, you just compute it with a trace as usual. And these volume terms are just a trace over these projectors. This is like how you count microstates in, in quantum mechanics. And then observation entropy is defined as follows. You have the probability PX, so you average here, and then you have this minus log PX term plus log VX. And the first term is like a Shen, uh, Shen entropy term, and the second one is like an average Boltzmann entropy term. So you really see that this nicely interpolates between both concepts and um, depends in particular crucially on the coarse graining you choose. And I think this is really nice because it really is a definition which explicitly reflects uh, the experimental capabilities from the start. Okay. And now you might wonder okay, which coarse screening do I have to choose? I mean, at the end, this is determined by the experiment and, and not every theoretical possible coarse screening is meaningful from a seminar perspective. And in the last part of my talk, I will show you um, a few coarse screenings which, which make sense in my point of view. Um, however, so far it's a, just a general definition and I uh, only want to briefly comment on its, on its history how it appears in the literature. So quantum mechanically, this was first introduced in a paper by von Neumann, uh, from which I quoted already, actually. 
Um, also in a footnote, he clearly says, oh, actually this definition is due to Wigner and Wigner will write another paper about it. But as far as I know, I'm not aware of any paper from Wigner that he then wrote uh, about it. If you have more background in, in classical statistical mechanics, you might notice that this is basically uh, identical to a concept which is sometimes also called coarse grained entropy and which was at least introduced by Gibbs already. Um, and where these volume terms are really like phase space cells which have a coarse grain and where you compute the volume of that in phase space. But I would claim that this definition, although it appears here and there from time to time, was more or less forgotten. So if, if that would be a real life seminar and not an online seminar, I would like to ask the audience who of you has, has seen this definition before, but I can't do that. But I saw this definition first in, in that paper by, by Dominic and his co-workers from, from California. So I would say that they really revived this, this, this old concept and really said, OK, this is a good definition for thermodynamic entropy, even for uh, isolated quantum systems far from equilibrium. All right. And now we have a definition for, for heat and for entropy. And the final missing quantity is temperature. That's the last slide of the second part. Remember, I want to define a temperature which is valid even in principle for an out of equilibrium system. And I can do that, there are many ways, but one way to do it is via this defining equation. So on the left, you look at some isolated system. Uh, there's a density matrix rho, a Hamiltonian H. So that's just the expectation value. Uh, of the energy, so it's internal energy, which you can compute for any state row. And you ask, okay, what would be the effective inverse temperature beta star of a Gibbs state, which gives me the same expectation value in energy, all right? And this gives a one-to-one -one relation between energy and, and, and the temperature beta star. And again, this is actually quite an old concept, which I think is not used so much in, in the contemporary literature. And as far as I know, it actually goes back to, to this paper by, by, by Mushik, where it's also called a non-equilibrium contact temperature, and where he introduced it really as a completely phenological concept. So he was not using this equation. It was within phenological thermodynamics. And the nice thing is that this definition has an independent operational explanation. Namely, T star equals the temperature of a superbars that causes a vanishing net heat exchange when coupled to the system. So what do I mean by that? So what is a superbars? A superbars is just an ideal big thermodynamic object which has some temperature. And whatever you put into contact with the superbars, the superbars will just equilibrate that, that system. Uh, with the temperature set by, by the temperature of the superbars. And now imagine that you basically have different superbars at your disposal. They all have different temperatures, T1, T2, T3, T4. And you ask, OK, which of them, so which temperature do I have to choose such that when I couple the system to it and the system relaxes in the long run to a Gibbs state, um, what is that temperature where I observe no net heat exchange between the system and the bars. And this condition is equal to that equation, basically, where you ask, OK, let's say the initial energy of the system. That would be the final one, because the system is relaxed to a Gibbs state. You want to be them uh, the same, which means that there is no, no heat flow. All right? And this explains this uh, temperature concept. Uh, Philip, uh, Dominic has a question. Sure. Yeah, so so I guess this assumes something about the superbath, I guess, at least uh, weak, weak interaction and maybe some kind of interaction that mixes up all the energy eigenstate in the system. So it's, uh, I don't know, maybe you could talk about a bit more about that. Yes. So yeah, I mean, the superbath, exactly. I mean, this is kind of an idealization which comes with a lot of assumptions um so so basically as i said you assume that your system whatever your initial system state is in the long run it equilibrates the Gibbs state and this of course means that there shouldn't be any conserved quantities the coupling should be sufficiently weak and and all that um but 
yeah, I mean, these are the assumptions go, that, that go in, but generically, I would say they are satisfied for, for many for many situations. All right, thanks. But yeah, you're completely right. That's, yeah. Okay, well, so this was the end of the second part. Again, if you have more questions on how to define things, uh, let me know. If not, I will just now actually quite quickly go through uh, results and applications of these uh, definitions. So let me start with result one, which I so, call one. Sorry, oh. Philip. Uh, yeah, yes. we have a question uh, from Varinder. Sure. Yeah. Hi, Philip. Hi. Thanks for nice talk. Okay, can you go back one slide? Yes. Okay, the question is, you are defining your effective non-equilibrium temperature, but actually in the long run, but in the long run, it uh, the system automatically becomes, uh, you can say, comes into the equilibrium. Then how can you say that it is like non-equilibrium temperature? Uh, wait, okay, I think one has to distinguish between this operational explanation and this mathematical definition. So that mathematical definition does not at all assume long run or anything. It's just an equation. It gives you a one-to-one -one mm -hmm. relation between energy and, and temperature. And you can immediately apply it to any state and you get this out. And actually in the equations, or what I show you in the next uh, part, I'm not assuming that the system equilibrates to a Gibbs state in the long run, because I'm also not assuming that there is actually a super mass. Okay. The reason why I put this up is basically to tell you, look, if you want to measure it experimentally, so if you're not happy with theory and say, oh, I don't want to just know a mathematical definition, then that would be a way to, to, to measure it experimentally. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah. So it's really important to distinguish between the, the mathematical definition and this and explanation. This. Okay. Thank you. All right, um, so then if there's no further question, let me come to result one, which I call von Neumann's H theorem. Again, it goes back to this uh, important paper by von Neumann. There was actually a long commentary article about it uh, a few years ago and also translation because it was written in, in, in German. Um, so but now it's available in English as well. And von Neumann considers the following setting an isolated system with time-independent non-integrable Hamiltonian H and a sufficiently coarse, coarse graining X with no special orientation. So now if you're not from the community of equilibration, thermalization, isolated many-body system, let me um, translate these three words or three phrases. So non-integrable basically means that not only the spectrum of H has no degener degeneracies, but also there are no degenerate energy gaps in the Hamiltonian, all right? Sufficiently coarse means that the number of different projectors or measurement outcomes that you can distinguish should be still much, much smaller than the dimension of the Hilbert space. So that makes sense, of course, if you have a really large system, I mean, even with 100 particles, uh, you know, say the, the dimension of the Hilbert space is two to the 100, and it's not possible to, to really distinguish between all those different microstates. Um, if you could, then of course, you wouldn't expect the statistical mechanics to work. So this should be sufficiently coarse. And no special orientation means that basically the um, basis transformation between X and H, this should not be aligned in any special way. So basically, what von Neumann does is applying some kind of random matrix theory, you could say, between the, the transformation between the eigenvalues of H and X. All right. These are quite a couple of uh, assumptions, but I mean, the theorem I think is really beautiful and, and quite powerful because von Neumann shows that for all initial states, really whatever you take, it doesn't matter. The observational entropy of that state with respect to this core screening as a function of time t will be close to its maximum value for almost all times t, all right? I'm not going to prove this theorem here, but I will show you with you proof by numerical example. Again, this taken, is taken from, from a paper by Dominic. So they considered basically a few electrons hopping on a discrete lattice, and they start with a low entropy state with, with low observational entropy. 
And then they see that this entropy quickly increases and reaches kind of a steady value. And in fact, this green line is the maximum entropy, uh, maximum observation entropy of that system. Um, and you see, you basically remain very close to that value for, for almost all times. Okay, now let me switch perspective and let's go to open quantum systems again. Sorry, Philip, uh, before that, uh, Dominic wants to add something. Hmm. Sure. Well, not ask, I actually have a question. Uh, could it go slide back? So I wonder, because you say for all initial states, but what about energy eigenstates? Because these will not evolve, right? Yes, but they will have a high entropy. So they will basically be maximum entropy states because you assume that 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 basically you average between, you know, with this no special orientation, what okay. you do is you say there's H and then there's X, and then I take all possible X as equally likely for a fixed energy eigenbasis H. So if you take if you take a any eigenstate here, this will be basically completely mixed in, in, in that X basis. Right. Yeah, okay. I know. I remember that you said do something like that for quantum systems. Yes. Using using ETH. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Thanks. But yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting limiting case. Yes. We we have another uh, question sure. by Dario. Yeah, I guess here, uh, I mean, going, I mean, following what Dominic was saying, I guess here is, here is crucial that the system is non-integrable, right? Such that the eigenstates are really, let's say, typical state. I mean, uh, they are almost random, right? So probably if you take an integrable system, it's possible. Oh. Uh, Dario, but, we lost you. But I, mean, I, guess, I guess I got the question for, mm -hmm. for the comment. I mean, so this non-integrability condition, I think that's really important if you look at time evolution, because this allows you to really make a time average where things simplify a lot and you cancel a lot of terms. I think for this um, simple, I mean, for, for the point put up by Dominic, I mean, that's, I mean, that's not dynamic, that's a purely static argument. And I think this really comes in really due to the average of all of all these, these X, right? So basically, if, if this is completely random and you just look at an eigenstate, I mean, also H doesn't really matter. It's just, if you take a random state um, and you have some fixed coarse graining, I mean, that's, I guess, an equivalent way to see it, then almost all states have like, uh, distributed according to maximum entropy. You know, this is kind of a typicality argument. But if, if you want to clarify or add something more, I mean, I'm happy if, if, if you're back, Dario. <laughs> uh, yeah, we lost Dario, but uh, I just admitted him again. Okay. Dario, are you back? Uh, I suggest we, we uh, yeah, go I mean, on and... Yeah. We can discuss this also afterwards. I mean, it's, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm back right now, but yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you get the, the, the question or not. I mean, I was saying probably here to, I mean, following what Dominic was saying, probably here is crucial the assumption that the system is non-integrable, right? Because if the system, I mean, the fact that it's non-integrable means that the states will be, let's say, highly typical and uh, non, uh, I mean, almost random, right? Yes, but so what, what, I, what I was claiming is that this non-integrability is important if you look at the time evolution. But it's not important for, for, Dominic's point. So he said, let's take an eigenstate of H. Yeah. And and why does this have maximum entropy? And, and what I'm saying is this comes from the average by saying that H and X, basically this basis transformation is related by, by, by a random unitary, right? 
I see. And, and this is kind of a typicality argument, more or less. But, exactly. Mean, but I was thinking that to apply a typicality argument is really important that the system is non-integrable. Otherwise, a typicality argument could not no, be but, correct. But I think typicality is really an argument which only relies on a large Hilbert space dimension and, and having see. something at random. So, you know, choosing a corresponding ah, okay. X at random is basically I see. Know, the inverse picture is okay. to say, let's, let's choose X fixed but let's choose a random state, right? Okay, got it, yes. And okay. because the Hilbert space dimension is so large, you know, and so I think this doesn't mm -hmm. really care about the non-integrability, but- I see, okay, yes, yes, yes. Because essentially, let's say X can be whatever you want, okay. Yes. Okay, got it, yes. That's a, I think that's I a subtle point, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks for the question. Good, so now let me, uh, turn to the open system paradigm and to this hierarchy of second laws and the Claudius inequality which we discussed already. So first of all, I have to specify what kind of coarse grading do I take for my open open quantum system, and I choose one I think which which would be the most relevant for for experiments today uh, on open quantum systems. Um, namely, I assume that the system is very small and we have precise control over it. So the projectors here are really rank one projectors on, an, on a basis you can choose, like spin up and spin down and this is for this qubit, if you like. And for the bars, we really have almost no information, but we know we have to know a little bit of information. And I assume that you're able to do a coarse grain measurement of, of energy here. So I try to be, you know, I try to sketch this here. You have these different energy levels and you discretize them in, in coarse grain windows of, of width delta. And you, you assume that you roughly know the energy of the bars. You can generalize this and choose different ones, but that's the one which, which I will uh, choose now. And for simplicity, I make an assumption about the initial state. I mean, please recall that the derivation of the second law requires some, some special initial state. And I will assume that the system is initially in an arbitrary state and decoupled from a Gibbs state of the bars with respect to some temperature beta zero. Again, I can generalize this to correlated states. You can treat multiple bars and also the Gibbs set assumption is not crucial. But this gives, I think, the most uh, interesting results and it's anyway an often used assumption in, in open quantum system theory. So in fact, what you get out, that's really the, the main result of this paper, is that you really can derive this hierarchy of second laws. So um, if you accept that observational entropy is a good candidate for semilunar entropy, so if you substitute this by saying, okay, that's the semilunar entropy of system and the bars, that's the only one of the system that's of the bars and so on, then this really looks identical to the hierarchy of second laws I presented you uh, before. Of course, here you have this non-equilibrium temperature appearing because I'm not making any equilibrium assumptions during the time evolution. And I want to emphasize that for these kind of projectors, which are rank one precise uh, uh, projectors, observation entropy for the system becomes equal to the Neumann entropy, okay? And a nice feature or outcome is that really you have an inequality here, right? So you really go from, from one version of the second law to a loser bound by somewhat including less information. And you can precisely quantify the difference in each line. And this is uh, shown here on this slide. So between the first two lines, the difference is given by an observation, uh, by, by, by mutual information uh, between the system and the bars then the difference between these two lines you can quantify by a relative entropy so if you don't know what, what relative entropy is it's just some kind of measure of a statistical distance between two probability distributions or uh, density matrices and it's, it's precise definition is, is not too important here but these two lines the difference really measures uh, uh, measures the distance between your actual coarse grain probability distribution for the bars energies um, with respect to an equilibrium distribution where you use this kind of non-equilibrium effective temperature at that time. 
t. And the final two lines, there's again a relative entropy uh, which measures the distance, well, the difference. Namely, it's the distance between your, your effective Gibbs state at time t, which you would associate to your, to your non equilibrium bar state and the initial Gibbs state. And, and I think in particular the last result, this was actually uh, not found out in, in the paper I showed you on the previous slide, but this was derived here. And I, I think it's a very simple and very nice uh, uh, expression. And in that paper, we also argue that, that this expression allows you to compute that you really get universal efficiency improvements whenever you consider thermodynamic processes uh, in presence of a finite size heat bars, all right? I will not talk about uh, that today. It's a short paper, you can, you can take a look. But here, I think, I mean, it's really nice. I mean, remember also the mutual information can be written as a relative entity. So you really see at each stage, what is the information you basically neglect in your description and everything is really precisely characterized in terms of information theoretic quantities. Uh, Philip, uh, Dominic yes. has a question. Sure. Yeah, I have a question about the, the mutual information part and other data. So you start uh, unentangled in this product state. So you start a diff, right? Yes. And, but then when it evolves, it stops being additive, it becomes correlated. So suddenly there is some non-zero mutual information. Yes. But then as it equilibrates, um, at least in the numerical experiments we did, we, we saw that it seems to be zero again, or maybe not, maybe it's just negligible. Um, yes, so I mean, I think that's actually a good question. What is what is the influence of each term, you know? I mean, which of these terms yeah, is dominating, true. right? And I, I mean, I think, but first of all, an answer I think would be very long. And second, I must admit that I also don't have a full complete overview. So at least for the open system paradigm, what I can tell you is that, you know, the system you typically have, you know, you often use very small systems, say a qubit and the bars is large. And then this mutual information term is, bounded from above by the logarithm of the dimension of the smaller Hilbert space. So if you have a qubit, it's really log two. And, and, and that term will certainly be small typically compared to these terms, mm -hmm. um, which can be much larger. And, and I think the relevance of this term is actually related to the question whether entropy is additive or extensive, right? So typically for macroscopic systems, you would expect that this should become small, um, but I mean, it's it's a very interesting and open question. Right? Yeah, I would still say well, it's maybe small compared to the entropy of the full system, but also the system's entropy is very small. It's also bounded by log two, right? Yes, that's true. Right. So it might not be. It might be comparable to the entropy of the system. If that's what you care about. I mean, that that's true. I mean, it depends a lot on, on, on what kind of process you have. You know, assume you start from a non-equilibrium state and you just look at relaxation back to equilibrium. Then anyway, the entropy reduction will be not very large. And and like terms like this mutual information or the change in system entropy can be dominant. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, think about that, you know, you have here your atom, you drive it with a laser, and you drive it for a couple of minutes or hours or seconds even. And the atom, you know, does many oscillations and emits a lot of energy into the bars. Then the, the change in entropy of a system, this is always bounded, as you say, that cannot happen much. But still, the system is constantly emitting energy into the bars. And under these kind of non equilibrium drivings or conditions, it will be these terms here on the right hand side, which will grow like really large and makes these terms, like these system terms, very small. Mm. Yeah, very good, very interesting. Yeah, so it, yeah, it's interesting. I think still a lot of open questions here. Um, and I think, well, the problem is that there's no simple universal answer. <laughs> okay, so up to now, I mean, what I showed you were really, I think, fairly general results. Uh, this is always nice, but 
I think the devil is in the details. So when you want to apply things, um, you might say, okay, wow, how do I use this and compute, uh, for instance, observational entropy. So the last two slides will be a bit about more practical considerations, and in particular about a master equation approach, which allows you to compute observational entropy. And this is due to a recent paper, but let me emphasize that the basic idea for this master equation uh, goes back a bit, a bit further in time to, to those papers. And let's consider the standard setup, a system coupled to a bus. And now if you know a bit of open quantum system theory, then the standard approach is to like trace out the bars, neglect really everything and only look at the system. But why not doing it a bit differently and keeping some core square information about the bars? So actually what we're looking for is an, is an effective evolution equation for these probabilities, which give you the probability to find the system in some state S, some microstate like spin up or spin down, and the bars to be in one of those core square energy windows. And with this, you keep some information about the bars and you can compute observation entropy. And interestingly, also uh, your, the, the accuracy of your master equation is, is much better than the accuracy of standard master equations where you just do weak coupling and neglect completely the bars. And I, I try to sketch this here. So here we have a, a two-level system coupled to some bars via a random matrix. And what you can see is the exact Schrodinger dynamics, it's a green line. And then this kind of master equation, which perfectly matches. And for comparison, we take the standard born mark of secular master equation, which you obtain by fully tracing out and doing the, uh, the Markov and secular approximations for the system. And you see that this is really completely off. So that's not just some small perturbative difference, but this is really a qualitative difference. And the interesting point is that also this equation, we derive it in a weak coupling regime. So we also do a Markov approximation, a weak coupling approximation, a secular approximation, all that. And, 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 and still you get a, a very huge difference, which is due to the fact that you take into account what happens in the bars. And now you might say, okay, this comparison is maybe not fully justified, because the bars, in fact, is finite in this case. And you shouldn't use a born Markov secular equation for, for finite bars. And maybe if we adapt the temperature of this born Markov secular equation in a time dependent way, so to take into account that the bars is evolving, you get a much better uh, and correct um, prediction of the dynamics. And that's, that's almost right. So this we did, and this is. Uh, was our last and most recent project. And um, again, we look at some, I mean, this system is a bit different from the system before, but it doesn't really matter. It's a central spin model. And we compared three different dynamics, namely this. So these are the populations of, of some of the energy um, eigenstates here. So the orange or yellow line it's really a standard born mark of secular master equation where you do not adapt the temperature of the bar. So you just keep it fixed to the initial value and you get this line. Then there's a way to have a born mark of secular equation with an adapted temperature, so which changes in time and which can be determined self consistently. And this gives you this green line. And, and the real dynamics basically predicted by, by our master equation. So the master equation for that object, which we derived here, gives you the blue line. So you see the green one with the time dependent temperature is much closer, but also does not completely get the, the exact dynamics. And what we say is really that you have a hierarchy of master equations where each master equation is more accurate, but of course you also have to take into account a bit more information. So each, you know, the more accurate the master equation gets, it also gets, of course, a bit harder to simulate. Um, and I think there still remains to be much to be understood. <laughs> we are still not experts on this, but I think there are two general results, which I really like about these projects. So first of all, you could ask, okay, how do I have to adapt this, this temperature in the master equation? And what we argue is that the best temperature you can choose here 
is this non-equilibrium temperature, which I introduced uh, in part two at the end, so a few slides ago. And this gives additional evidence for, for the usefulness of this concept. And then I think that these papers really provide the first direct evidence of how the bath distribution influences the open quantum system dynamics. And I think I have to explain this a little bit because we all know that, I mean, there are many people working on non-Markovian open quantum systems and non-perturbative approaches, uh, which all go well beyond the born mark of secular approach and which are very sophisticated. But in all those approaches, you still completely trace out the bars somehow. So you see deviations in your system dynamics from the born mark of secular prediction, but it's hard afterwards to identify what is the cause. Is it a strong coupling? Is it some non-Markovian feature? Is it that the bars distribution changes and is different from a Gibbs state? And here in our approach, because we keep the information about the bars distribution, we can really play around. Okay, what's the effect of a microcanonical state on the system dynamics? What's the effect of a Gibbs state? And so on and so forth. And here you really see that even at weak coupling, uh, apparently the Gibbs distribution for the bars might not be always accurate enough to predict the dynamics and the steady state of, of your system. Uh, and, Philip, uh, yes. Dominic has a question or comment. Right. Uh, yeah, I didn't quite get what is the y-axis here. And, oh, uh, time. I oh, know this axis. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. And this is, so here what we take is the spin coupled to many other spins. And actually the spin, I think it's like a big spin. I think it has like 10 levels. And epsilon four, I think it's just the force, uh, you know, the population of, um, the dynamic of the population of uh, the, the force energy eigenstate of the spin. And we initialize the spin and, and spin up in the highest energy eigenstate and then it relaxes somehow and emits energy into the bars. Okay, so you can you just take one kind of test uh, probability or something? Yeah, we take one of the, you know, the probability to find the spin in its force energy eigenstate. Right. And is, is that a correct answer? Because you said this one is better, this one is better, this one is better, but I don't see the what should be the correct answer. Or... The correct answer to, to what? Uh, to the time evolution of this probability B. Because ah. you said your master equation is the best, right? But I, I cannot compare because I don't Right. Know I mean, okay, point. the best one would be, of course, the full unitary dynamics. When we have problems in this system to simulate the unitary dynamics, but what we basically do is we first of all go to the weak coupling regime and then we check. So we have an, you know, at weak coupling, the dynamics of your system is completely determined basically by a two point correlation function in the bars. And for this, we have an approximate method to compute it. And we check that our approximate correlation function for the bars matches the exact correlation function for the bars. So really, the, we make sure that we use here this, the, the right correlation function for the bars. Um, and then if you had weak coupling, I think it's relatively safe to, to claim that this gives you the correct dynamics, at least if you're not at very low temperatures, right? So close to zero temperature, things also break down. Um, mm -hmm. But it's true because I don't know how many spins we have here in the bath. I think around 100 or so. Um, we can no longer do full exact dynamics. But okay. based on our experience with, with that kind of model, we would say that, that you know, our master equation to so the blue curve here should be very close to, to the real situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Can I add to this question? Uh, uh, is, isn't centr central spin problem integrable? Uh, no. No, as far as I know not. So basically, you have independent spin spins here. They're all sigma z. And basically, they, they couple via sigma x to the central spin. And due to the non commutativity of sigma z and sigma x, I don't think that you have a integrable. But I mean, even if you have, I mean, this wouldn't change, I think, the, the argument in a sense that you could still ask the question, okay, for this integrable model, what, what is the dynamics of the system? Mm 
But it's true. If it were integrable, then we could, of course, plot the exact time evolution as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think it's not. Okay. But, Thank you. But if, if you have a reference, yeah, let me let me know, please. Mm -hmm. We can look uh, later. Cool. Okay, so this was all uh, of my talk. So let me just conclude. Um, I think, I mean, I'm convinced that we now have really all the tools to quantitatively study non-equilibrium thermodynamics of systems of arbitrary size. I put up again this initial motivation, because I think it's a really nice experiment and actually want to look at this now a bit closer with, with these uh, theoretical tools. Uh, I think this also motivates you to, to, to look at these things. And if I can recommend only one reference to you, um, very selfish, let me recommend uh, that paper. Uh, but in particular, this is a tutorial article on entropy in the second law. Although I would claim it also contains a lot of new results, for instance, the first derivation of this Clausus inequality from 1865. And it also contains all the reference that I showed you in, in, in this talk, except of the very last one and uh, with this hierarchy of master equations. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the talk and I'm, I'm very happy to, to receive questions and comments also by email. Uh, and yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Philip, for your uh, excellent and interesting talk. Uh, let us thank our speaker. And so uh, the floor for questions is open. Uh, Varinder, please go ahead. So, okay, Philip, again, thanks for a very nice talk. So actually the question is, so what is your take on the question of difference between like classical thermodynamics and quantum thermodynamics? Ah, well, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, actually I think that for, I mean, really, if you look at fundamental problems of statistical mechanics, you know, really the foundations, where do things come from, the second law and, and entropy, I think the concepts you use in, in, in classical and um, quantum statistical mechanics are basically similar. So I don't think that there's this huge difference, um, which is sometimes for me a bit overemphasized about uh, quantum aspects. So I think, you know, Boltzmann got most of the explanations already quite right, although he was doing only classical statistical mechanics. However, I mean, let me <laughs> tell you a quote again from this von Neumann paper. Mm. So von Neumann said something like that. I mean, I, I found it very uh, funny. He said, well, obviously all, all foundational problems in statistical mechanics are much easier using the new quantum mechanics compared to the old classical mechanics. And then he put a footnote saying, uh, for all particular uh, applications, the opposite is of course true. But I think he was right in the sense that, you know, for instance, this kind of counting of microstates argument, according to Boltzmann, you know, this requires to introduce some coarse graining actually of the phase space. And then you see even classical statistical mechanics and H bar appearing somehow to define the minimum phase space cell. And that's absent in quantum mechanics, you know, counting microstates in the, in the Hilbert space is much easier. Also, I think entanglement and all these kind of things, which you don't have classically, they really help uh, to, to establish equilibrium in, in isolated quantum systems. So, um, so, so the underlying mechanism, I would say, is, is, is very different and, and, and in some sense easier in quantum mechanics, although of course, to simulate things, <laughs> things get hard. But the overall concepts you use, I think they, they are both valid in both, both cases. And for particular uh, applications, you have to see, maybe there's a quantum benefit, but maybe also there's a, a classical benefit in some sense, right? And that's still an open question, yeah. Like uh, um, classical benefit, what do you like mean by classical benefit? Usually we take some kind of if quantum resources. So then we say we have like uh, 
quantum advantages we can get more efficiency or more work extraction from heat engines but what is uh, like classical benefits yeah. Uh, yeah i think there are two points i mean first of all i think it's a bit unfair if you only take into account quantum uh, resources right so you can say ah i use coherence and this doesn't exist classically so i get better but also classically you can think about resources um like population, inverted states, non-homogeneous distributions, all that, they would also give you some, some boost in, in efficiency or power output. And I think one has to be careful to really compare things on an equal footing. And on top of that, I mean, what I like to say, I mean, if you have a windmill, a windmill does not need to be cooled down to below one Kelvin, okay? A windmill yeah. just works. And, and I think at the moment, at least in quantum dynamics, we I don't think that we have at the moment really the tools, the theoretical tools to give a fully fair comparison between classical and quantum worlds, because you neglect all the resources you need to prepare the experiment, you know. And uh, so it's, it's an interesting uh, question, um, but one has to be careful, I think, yeah. Okay, thank you. Do we have any uh, further questions? Uh, Dominic? Yeah, I have a follow-up <coughs> follow question on Verinda's question. Um, and I don't know the answer, so it's still a question. Uh, isn't it possible that quantum systems caramelize faster because classical do uh, when they evolve, they can create some correlations, but that's at most correlations, right? But quantum can create entanglement, doesn't make them to thermalize faster. Yes. Um, no, I think you're right. I mean, yeah, that's what I wanted to, to say somehow when I said that entanglement helps to explain equilibration and thermalization. And that I think maybe mm -hmm. it is really necessary. So explaining equilibration and, and thermalization in classical mechanics, I think is, is really hard, if not Im impossible, you know. I mean, you have this kind of ergodic hypothesis, but, you know, the time until, you know, your system needs to really sample the full allowed phase space is, is so large that it's somehow, I think it's not a, I mean, you're not an expert, but I think it's not a really good justification. I think really, you're right that entanglement helps make things faster and and it might be really necessary to to explain that mm. okay yeah in that in that paper that uh, we wrote on this classical observation entropy it seemed that they, you know like scale wise the classical quantum were about the same but uh, but i don't know which which systems to compare right you should have exactly the same classical equivalent of the quantum system then compare the speeds which we didn't do so i don't know yeah it's true yeah it's again hard to compare things and yeah mm. yes thanks yes thank you okay do we have any other questions from the audience Seems not. So uh, in this case, uh, let us thank uh, Philip again. Thank you.